Dear friends, buongiorno. Good morning in South America and USA. Good afternoon in Europe. Good, good night in China. Welcome to the second session, second webinar of week uh, six. Before we start, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, the program of week seven. I don't know if you can exactly see my sharing. One second. Okay. Week seven, uh, we will have uh, uh, different topics. Uh, it's going to be on uh, craniofacial growth, eruption disturbances, and auto-transplantation. We will have uh, a sequence of speakers. The on Monday, uh, Dr. Perrang will talk about normal and abnormal dentofacial growth. And uh, it's just the inheritance of uh, Bjork studies. Then Karin Bechter will talk about disturbed tooth eruption, etiology, diagnosis, and treatment. This is on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, uh, Dr. Chervy and Dr. Trotman will talk about facial cleft and craniofacial update on orthodontics and surgery. And we will end the uh, week seven with the presentation of Eva Chukroska on auto-transplantation of developing premolars to the anterior maxilla, an orthodontic perspective. So without any further ado, I let the, uh, I hand over the, the floor to uh, Eve to introduce the speaker and the moderators of today. Well, thanks, Renato. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear postdoctoral fellows, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Antonino Secchi from Devon in state of Pennsylvania, USA. Dr. Secchi is originally from Chile, with, but with Italian grandparents, and he came to the US and more specifically to the University of Pennsylvania to earn there his DMD, his certificate in orthodontics, and a master of science in oral biology. He taught over there for 10 years at the University of Pennsylvania, holding there the position of clinical assistant professor and clinical director of the Department of Orthodontics. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics, and Dr. Secchi has published in various dental and orthodontic peer-reviewed journals in the areas of treatment mechanics and straight wire appliance. By the way, he wrote uh, the chapter Contemporary Mechanics Using the Straight Wire Appliance in the last two editions of the famous Graeber textbook. Dr. Setsi received the 2005 David C. Hamilton Orthodontic Research Award from the Pennsylvania Association of Orthodontists and the 2010 and 2013 Outstanding Teacher Award from the Department of Orthodontics of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Setsi is the founder of the Complete Clinical Orthodontic System in collaboration with Dentsply GAC and the Setsi Institute. I would like also to thank our moderators of today and my fellow countrywoman, Dr. Patricia Aubac de Jean from Auch, France, a diplomat of the European Board of Orthodontics, member of the Angle Society of Europe, and Dr. Professor Peter Nam, Branson Madrill Endowed Professor in Orthodontics and Chair, West Virginia University School of Dentistry, Harvard and University of Pennsylvania grad, and diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics from Angle East. The title of Antonino's lecture today is Class 2 Treatment, Emphasis on Diagnosis. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear fellows, please welcome warmly Dr. Secchi, Antonino. We are all ears. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eve. You're welcome. So I will share my screen now and start with the presentation. So um, um, before we start, I would like to thank uh, Ute Schneider and Renato Cocconi for this amazing idea of putting these uh, presentations in these difficult times where everybody's at home. I think it's a great way to share uh, what we do uh, and around the world. So um, thank you very much again for inviting me and I hope I can uh, uh, share um, a couple of things of, of, uh, uh, in these amazing topics that is class two treatment. And, um, and I wanted to emphasize uh, the diagnosis. 
So um, I also want to use this moment to uh, remember uh, one of our, uh, one of my dear mentor, Dr. Uh, Sligman Orzo, um, great um, uh, professor, mentor, and friend, a um, uh, member of the Angles of Society too. He was chairman of the Uni University of Pennsylvania for 27 years. So when people ask me, so how do you treat class two? Uh, the, the answer is, is, a, is, is a little bit complex because uh, it's uh, what, are you, what are you treating or what do you want to correct? Are we talking about increase over jet, class two molar relationship? Are we talking about retrognatic mandibles? Are we talking about prognatic maxilla? So what is, I mean, we can just say we treat class two with this way here. We use functionals, we use extractions, we use surgery. So I think it's confusing. Uh, specifically today, there are so many uh, appliance uh, driven orthodontics um, that everybody has the new gadget that uh, is the best one to treat the class two. But then you start using it, and for some reason, it doesn't work in some cases. And you don't understand what happened. Case selection, did I miss something? So you can't put class two in just one, uh, one big package. We need to be more accurate in defining what are, what are, what are we trying to achieve. So um, uh, is dental, is skeletal? And if it's skeletal, how you diagnose that it's skeletal? Are we using the right tools? So uh, also we know that class two by definition is a sagittal dimension. So what are, what are the implications of the uh, vertical dimension and the transverse dimension that is so important for us at the University of Pennsylvania in the class two treatment. So we wanna to touch a little bit upon those things too. So um, yesterday I was uh, listening very carefully to Dr. O'Brien and he mentioned some of the articles that they were published in the, uh, in the literature, in the Cochrane re Review. And uh, very interestingly, um, one of the title was orthodontic treatment for prominent upper front teeth, basically over jet. Uh, and they put in parentheses class two malocclusion. So um, this is what I would treat in. I would really treat in only uh, over jet. Are all the over jets the same? Can we treat all the over jets the same way? Um, so uh, I was pretty um, uh, amazed by, by the type of research that is being done. So here, please look at these two little diagrams where I have the same over jet in these uh, trays that I sort of, uh, I'm showing you just one part of it. So you can have the same over jet. Even you can have the same A and B or very similar but you can have completely different patterns, completely different patterns that will react to your treatment completely different. Basically, you have completely different mandibles. You can have more uh, vertical, more um, uh, horizontal growers, and we need to understand this to be able to um, predict and also utilize the right tools for the treatment that we want. So it's not just the overjet. By just focusing on the overjet, we can miss a lot of things. Even by using the A and B, we can be completely off. So we need to see a little bit more than that. So um, what happened with the intracranial uh, planes that most cephalometric uh, analysis uses, like the Frankfurt plane or, or the Selanesium plane, they're very variable. So it's a lot of variability and uh, you can have different angles on the uh, SNA plane or Frankfurt horizontal and that will give you a completely different reading of how the upper and the lower jaw relates. And we use those supposedly to analyze skeletal relationship and it can be completely off. In fact, Arnett, the famous surgeon, uh, in 2004, published in the American Journal of Orthodontics, an interesting paper where he said, look at, I mean, I have here two identical tracings. And the only difference is how uh, angle is the selenation plane. And it's giving me two completely re reading. One is said that the maxilla is too protruded and the other one is saying that the mandible is, uh, is retrognatic. So, um, you can see that that uh, also uh, can happen the same thing uh, with planes like the Frankfurt Horizontal. So what about the vertical? As I pointed out before, the vertical is really important. Uh, angular measurements, specifically angular measurements, such as the A and B that we use every day, can be affected tremendously by uh, the vertical dimension. 
uh, remember that the angles, they, they, they open. So the, the more long is the phase, the same angle can show uh, that the synthesis is way uh, more retrognatic uh, than, than if the phase is, is shorter and you will have the same A and B. So um, again, is the A and B a, a really great um, tool to analyze uh, class two cases? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I use it, but it's not just the only number that I use. In fact, um, I really like uh, when it comes to cephalometrics uh, to dig into the Bureau of analysis because it's telling me the pattern of the patient, whether it's growing or it's not growing, it's telling me how that mandible is positioned in the face and how my treatment is going to respond um, to um, uh, uh, to, to the mandible and the chin projection. In fact, I like, and we don't have time to go over the whole your, uh, your, uh, your bag analysis, but it has relationships that are very important about the mandible. And um, it has also relationship between the ramus of the mandible and the um, anterior and posterior cranial bases. Also has angles that are very interesting that they can tell you where the mandible is positioned in the face, if it's too far back or too far forward. And what we find a lot is a lot of um, uh, compensations, um, but we need to know if there's very well compensated naturally or if it's not. And, and also the lower gonial angle that I use a lot to define whether the mandible is growing uh, vertical or not. And all of those um, measurements and many more uh, that the Virginia has they're very helpful to understand uh, what are you dealing with. I mean, imagine comparing this to just, let's say, the Steiner analysis, where the only thing that you have is just the A and B. I mean, uh, the A and B really doesn't tell you anything. In fact, the patient that I'm that I'm showing you right now, the cephalometric uh, the, 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 that you're seeing, is based on Jarabag, a beautiful mandible. It's a class one patient, and the uh, or the A and B is is seven. So if I have to do a research using A and B, I'm gonna put those uh, those cases into the class two, while those are really uh, class one with very good man mandibles. So um, having said that, uh, let me start showing you some cases um, where we can see some of the um, uh, ways that, that, that I used to correct class two in different type, type of patients again. So um, let me start with this uh, kid, um, 12 years old, Carthric, um, and you can see it's, a, uh, it's more like a brachycephalic uh, face, uh, a little bit recessive uh, chin, but, but really good mentum. Um, you can see it's a class two div one, if you look at the, at the intraoral views, and uh, it's a flaring upper incisors, so that would be an increased overjet. Um, <clears throat> that would be probably part of the subject of a study if you consider uh, people with a, a with a, a overjet of six, seven millimeters. Um, but when it comes down to the cephalometrics, uh, I will define this case a perfect class one. I mean, the mandible is 70 millimeters, uh, which is uh, one to one with the anterior cranial base. I have a gray ramus. Um, so this is a horizontal grower that every single millimeter of growth is gonna go forward with a very good uh, synthesis. So um, is this is the case that, 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 that most people um, uh, are very successful uh, treated uh, with, let's say, any class two non-compliance corrector uh, or any functional appliance. Uh, this is the case that, um, that is gonna work. This is the case that basically almost anything that you do if you do it right, is is going to work. Uh, I I treat these cases just with appliances. Um, I level the curve of speed in the lower jaw. So I can hear what what I'm doing is just starting uh, with a with a no one four uh, night tie wire, central oil wire. I go to the uh, um, 2020 BioForce arch wire, and then when I get to the stainless steel in this particular case, I decided to. To put a, a couple of uh, nine tie coil springs um, between the cannon and the molar, and to level um, the um, the lower occlusal plane. All these in conjunction with class two elastics from the upper canine to the lower second premolar, and you can see that in a couple of visits, the effect is leveling the curve of speed, 
<clears throat> and now I have uh, the um, occlusal plane of the upper and the lower arch very level. And the rest is just basically uh, remove the coils, um, go into the working stage to finish this case. Uh, you can see here the occlusal. Um, yes, with the coils, I gain a little bit of a room. Uh, the molars were, I wouldn't say distalized more than a millimeter, but beside the rotation, a little bit of distalization plus the reverse curve. And the case was corrected and it's a good grower. So everything is, is, in, a, is in my side here. And, and this is the finished case. And this is two year post treatment. And would it look like a big class two um, with a big overjet and that being actually a, a pretty nice class one after treatment, a good grower. We knew that because we used the, the, the right tool to, uh, to assess that. And uh, you can see the uh, chef before and after. And this is the cephalometric before and after, um, which is uh, within uh, the norm for a brachycephalic uh, case. Um, what about this case, John? A little bit different, 13 years old. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a full class two with a little bit of an overbite. Um, when you see the CEPH, to me, this is a, um, a, uh, a class one skeleton. I have a great mandible. The mandible is 79 millimeters compared to the anterior cranial base that is 80, is one to one ratio. I have a ramus that is not bad, it's 49. Um, and I have other numbers. The only number that is a little bit off is the lower gonial angle 78 that is still in you. It's not, it's mesocephalic to a little bit dolico, but that's the only thing. And I decided to treat this kid many years ago using Hedger. Um, and, uh, and that's the VTO. Um, this is the superimposition with the VTO, what I, uh, what I kind of hold the maxilla for a year and a half to two years, and allow the mandible to grow and to fix this class two, at least um, uh, from uh, the skeleton st uh, standpoint, and then use braces uh, to uh, class two elastics. So um, at this point, I would like to mention in this particular case, a paper that it was published um, uh, many years ago um, by the group of, um, of Iowa. And basically uh, what this paper is saying, and there are many more that they say the same thing is basically watch class two div one, because many of the class two div one, they have transverse discrepancies. There are many ways that we use to diagnose transverse discrepancies, but this paper is saying, please pay attention to it because by the time you realize there is a transverse discrepancy, it's kind of late. After you correct the sagittal, you will see how big the transverse discrepancy is. So it's better to diagnose the transverse discrepancy in every single case before we start. That's why in this particular kid, before we start treatment, he was narrowing the upper jaw compared to the lower jaw. So we use an expander, as you can see over there, that's after the expansion is done. And then after the expansion is done, we just uh, place the braces, and, um, and again, I start with a, a centralloid wire going to a 2020 BioForce wire, and then in the working stage, 19 by 25 stainless steel to level the occlusal plane. I use again, as I said, for a few months, uh, headgear, and then I switch to uh, class two elastics, as you can see right there. Um, <clears throat> here is the final large wire before we remove the braces, just to fine tuning the occlusion. And here's the case finish, uh, one year post-treatment. That's a four year post-treatment. And uh, <clears throat> this is um, the extra photograph. I'm sorry that I'm not so good. The kid is pointing down. Uh, I should have a better, a better shot. And this is the uh, cephalometric. So I mean, uh, he was basically, Based on the A and B class two, based on the Eurobag, for me was a class one. And, um, uh, so the pattern was again in our in our favor. And you can see the superimposition, uh, how the maxilla was held by the headgear and the mandible grew a little bit. So um, different case than before, uh, different way to uh, to treat it. So let's see now a a. Um, a um, uh, phase one case uh, and a phase two, two together. So this is Caitlin, 11 years old. As you can see, um, 
uh, has a, a, um, an ectopical uh, upper incisor and, and a class two man occlusion with crowding. So at this point, my main goal uh, was to, of course, give her some aesthetics because socially she had a, a huge problems with this type of uh, pro, uh, man occlusion. And of course, if you can see the cephalometrics, um, again, I mean, it is, I could say, um, slightly class slightly, slightly uh, vertical. Um, uh, when you have a lower gonial angle of 81, uh, it's kind of in the territory of the of the vertical mandibles. The ramus is not very, um, very long. So uh, uh, on a DMB7, uh, however, the mandible length uh, is not bad. So um, uh, what I did first, because of the transverse discrepancy, I uh, put an expander. Uh, I expand the case, and right after the expander, I follow with a uh, sort of a two by four um, to align the upper teeth. And you can see how uh, it changes from here to here. And, um, and that was basically, believe it or not, only eight weeks. And then another eight weeks, I was in the 2020 BioForce. Um, that was basically the end of uh, this phase, phase one. I accomplished what I wanted, it, which is correct the transverse dimension and give some aesthetics. And this is the upper and the lower arch after these um, uh, few months of uh, phase one. And then after that, um, we waited a little bit and we start phase two. And phase two was basically just uh, full braces. Um, level the occlusal plane and uh, stainless steel arch wires coordinated. And then of course, some um, uh, class two elastic, uh, our typical uh, pattern is a uh, short class two from the upper canine to the lower second premolar if the case is a non-extraction case. Like here, and then uh, just the final arch wires were vertical elastics to, um, to um, uh, get a better coupling and we remove the braces. That's the appointment that we remove the braces. That's why uh, the gums, they don't look that great. That's a little bit later. And uh, this is uh, our cable in two years uh, post-treatment. <clears throat> Here uh, is the extraoral uh, views post-treatment. And this is uh, the CEF. Um, so the mandible grew a little bit, not much. The ramus grew a little bit. So, I mean, we kept keep the, the pattern. Um, this is the pattern where absolutely you don't want to, um, uh, you don't want to distalize uh, because of the vertical component. And of course, um, in this case, you need to think of twice about extraction because the Caucasian a little bit flat lips and uh, not a very good team. So um, you just need to be careful controlling the vertical in this in this particular case. That's the superimposition. Uh, we were able to, to, to maintain the vertical. You can see uh, the superimposition um, um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, the y-axis is pretty much uh, the same before and after. Anna is a completely different class what we can call class two. It's a class two with a deep overbite, uh, 12 years old. Uh, we have these cases too, and if you can see, it's a class two, but it's not an overbite, pro I mean, an overjet pro problem. So again, I mean, how do you treat class two? It's all depend with class two we're talking about. So this is a very specific class two. When I have a 100% uh, overbite, I have a collapse of the upper and the lower arches, and in this particular case, if you can see how uh, even the premolars are leaning in and there's some crowding. And, uh, and you can see that when, uh, when Jorabak um, is showing us that again, that's a beautiful mandible, it's very long. As uh, Ramos is uh, 49 millimeters. So it's, uh, it's a brachiocephalic where everything is gonna grow forward, which is very good. And the main problem in my eyes here is of course how the, uh, incisors are related uh, to each other and they are all retroclined and that's why the overbite. So uh, another thing that is very interesting for me is many of these cases, deep overbite, people start thinking about which teeth we should intrude. Here it's not about intrusion. We don't have to intrude the upper or the lower. We have to, I mean, just level, just level and correct the inclination of these teeth. And that's why, as you can see, my VTO was basically just 
uh, torque the upper and the lower teeth for procline uh, and give them a normal inclination for a brachycephalic pattern. And, um, and that was basically the VTO that was my plan. And, uh, and at this point, it's interesting to, to notice another thing that most of these cases that they have this class two and on with a, uh, a, uh, a lack of inclination of the incisors, they have a reduced arch perimeter. So at the, uh, what you do by proclining the upper and the lower incisors to restoring the normal uh, inclination or torque if you want, um, basically uh, you also can increase the arch perimeter. And that's something very, very important uh, to, to, uh, to understand. Um, um, uh, Andrews, uh, many years ago, noticed that. He says, if you have a lack of inclination of the upper incisors and the lower incisors, even if the canines are too upright and you're in a class two, if you bring everything back to a class one and you don't restore the inclination and the tipping of the canines and the inclination of the upper incisors, you will you will uh, you will have spaces in the arch. So you need to do that to increase the arch perimeter and to have a, a, a good uh, final occlusion. So, um, and also the, the deep curve of speed. So we need to uh, level the curve of speed and that is due basically th uh, through uh, the art wire sequence. And in this very, very brachycephalic um, did by cases, I use a, uh, a, a reverse curve that I, I do it in the 19 by 25 stainless steel arch wire. So you can level the curve of speed in the lower jaw if you don't procline and you don't get the right torque in the uppers. And of course, we use class two elastics in these cases. Why class two elastic? Just today, they, they mentioned it um, in the lecture. I mean, you can use a lot of class two correctors that they will do the same. Um, in my mind, uh, the easiest one is the class two elastics. I mean, uh, there are many, um, there are many, uh, many appliances that they can do the same. I mean, if you're willing to uh, uh, to pay more money for them, I mean, class two elastics are really easy uh, when you un uh, when people understand how they work and uh, and you have to get these uh, kids involved in treatment. Uh, and, um, they they were really great. Uh, these non-compliance appliances, yeah, I mean, if you have a non-compliance patient, I mean, make sure that, that you convert him in a compliance one because maybe you can put a class two corrector, but he's not going to brush, he's going to break the bracket, he's going to, so I mean, it, at the end, it's the same. So um, um, we've been very successful, I guess, uh, in most, not all, in most of the kids with these class two elastics. So um, we level the cruise open in the upper, we level the cruise open in the lower, we restore the inclination. And, um, and that's how we correct the malocclusion. So we start here with Anna with an 014 centiloy arch wire. Uh, we go to a 2020 by 04. So when we have the upper jaw level and we create like a little bit of an overjet, uh, we start with the lower uh, arch just for comfort. Uh, we delay that a little bit. Uh, we um, erase the bar in the back with some stops so she doesn't bite on the brackets. And um, we level the upper and the lower. And when, when we get to the stainless steel arch wires at the second visit, uh, we take the lower arch wire, stainless steel, we put some reverse curvers uh, of speed. We uh, um, um, coordinate the arch wire back again. We put the class two elastics and the arch wire will level little by little the occlusal plane until uh, it's level with the, with the upper. We keep the class two elastics. We have a good inclination of the upper and the lower teeth. So we have a good over bad over jet. And basically we put the final large wire with some fine tuning things and uh, we took the braces off. So this is Anna after treatment uh, is completed. Uh, four year post treatment. <clears throat> uh, this is Anna, uh, you can see uh, her profile. It's a completely different pattern than the other cases. That's the beauty of it, that not everybody's the same. And again, when you see the, the, the staff, I mean, uh, the upper incisor is being uh, in a good inclination. Uh, some people like to say that um, uh, the upper in, uh, incisor should be parallel to the y-axis of rickets. I mean, so, I mean, you can see it's almost there. The lower incisor is a little bit proclined. 
And, uh, but for a brachycephalic case, it's absolutely fine. And, and so you can see that can be stable. Uh, lowering sasset to mandibular plane, if you use that measurement that has to do with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with ha how high or, or low angle is the patient. So you can say that, again, the incisor has to be 90 degrees for everybody. Absolutely not. It depends on the pattern. So um, that is the supreme position. Uh, if, if you want to see uh, what happened uh, in the treatment, how she grew uh, down and forward like uh, everybody does. Um, Zoe. So um, I, I wanted to also show that some, some cases, um, class 2-ish or class 2, we treat them with extractions when it's appropriate. And uh, so this is what I, I bring Zoe. Uh, she was um, uh, a teenager, I think, uh, 12 years old. Sorry, I put the, the, uh, the age. And it's a, it's a, she was toothy, big teeth, a little bit of an overbite, a little bit of an overjet, um, uh, cl class two and on. At least this is what you see in the mouth. Um, you can see the crowding, the arches are not really coordinated. So um, when you see the cephalometrics, it's a little bit of a class two. Um, uh, although the mandible is really good. It's another case that if you see the A and B, it's a class two, the overjet may be a class two, but the mandible, I mean, I feel very comfortable with it. It's a mandible that is in a relationship, uh, the length of the mandible one to one with the anterior cranial base, which is great. The ramus is 50, which is uh, pretty good. So again, I mean, we, we are, we are uh, working with a class two, but, but a very favorable pattern. And, and, um, and in this particular case, I just wanted to align everything uh, without, uh, without flaring too much teeth um, because of uh, uh, her chin was not very prominent. So, um, but, uh, so I remove in this particular case, uh, the upper and lower five, and I'm not gonna drive it to wire by wire because we don't have enough time to do that. But definitely we will uh, go from here to the final wire where um, I just uh, reposition a couple of teeth um, to get a better, a better intercaspation uh, with some vertical elastics. And that is the final wire when I place it. Uh, and this is on the day that we took the braces off where um, the occlusion um, a little bit better. We took the braces. And um, this is um, basically a one year post treatment. <clears throat> And this is um, the extra oral views after after treatment. So you can see the before and after for Zoe. And these are uh, the cephalometrics. Um, and that's the uh, superimposition. <clears throat> so um, what about, uh, somebody asked yesterday, I think, what about removing upper bicuspids? Um, I don't do that very much because maybe I, I, I don't have uh, too many of the typical patients that I would do it. But over the years, we have some patients. And I want to bring this girl here uh, that I treated many years ago because it's a very good case to, I guess, uh, explain um, the, what I think there, there are some of the ideal cases um, uh, to extract the upper bi bicuspid. And, um, this is a 14-year-old, uh, pretty um, uh, treated many years ago, and uh, it's a class two um, uh, with uh, flare flare teeth with an increased overjet. Um, uh, midlines are deviated. Uh, as you can see here the arches are kind of a flare out, they're protruded. Um, I'm sorry about the pictures; they're old. And uh, why is this a good case? Because this, uh, you need to reduce that overjet, but she's brachycephalic. And by moving the teeth back a little bit, I won't create any problems um, uh, in the chin, or I won't be basically losing um, some of the aesthetics. And because this patient, by having that type of pattern, brachycephalic with such a long mandible, such a long mandible, um, I know she's gonna grow and she has a really good chin. 
So right now it's not fully grown, but if it grows a little bit more, it's gonna look really good. So what are the cases that I wouldn't camouflage then with the extraction of the upper um, of the upper bicuspid? Uh, and I've done it, but I wouldn't do it again. Those are the typical uh, small lower jaws. I'll show you some of them, recessive chins where you uh, remove two upper bicuspid and you bring the upper teeth all the way back. And then um, you set the patient for future, eventually future problems, beside the fact that, that, that the aesthetic gets even worse. So um, upper bicuspid, brachycephalic, good mandibles, a little bit of an overjet. Not a lot of crowding in the lower jaw because in this particular case, I'm gonna have to upright the lower incisors and um, there is no crowding, so you can always do it by reshaping the lower arch. When these cases have a good mandible in the transverse, uh, here, um, pretty is basically wide, wide in the arches. So I have a lot of room to upright premolars and that create room to upright the incisors too. And um, not in every case you can do that. If you change one thing, you change everything. I mean, if you, if the same case, you have flare teeth and you have a lot of crowding, that becomes basically a completely different case. And um, even though we try not to remove this in the lower jaw in severe brachycephalic cases, because you all know that it's very difficult to manage that. But so um, again, it's a very old case. This is just one slide with the mechanics. We're closing the spaces here, trying to correct the mid lines. Uh, I finished the case, as you can see there, uh, these are uh, very uh, old uh, digital pictures um, uh, back in the days. Uh, you can see the change of the arches. I mean, um, uh, very interesting, uh, the lower, uh, the upper premolars, the upright, the incisors upright too without extractions. And um, this is the uh, face uh, of uh, Preti after treatment. Uh, I like the lips, and the lips, they are, they are, uh, they are very good, very good team, very good nebulacial um, angle, uh, ne nasal label angle, uh, as, as well as the mental soap is here, very well defined. So um, it's a very beautiful face. You can see this, the, the self before and after, and this is basically uh, the self before and after. I mean, a lot of upriding of the incisors in the lower without extraction. So you can do that only when you have a good lower jaw and, uh, and the premolars can upright, you can reach the lower arch. Um, now stable, yeah, I mean, if you, if you don't further the teeth out, specifically the canines, uh, the lower jaw can be stable. In this case, we didn't flirt with this. Uh, we upright the incisors, we uh, upright the premolars, and things change a lot. So you can see here is the superimposition. Uh, you can see the changes. The mandible grew exactly as we predicted uh, for, forward. Uh, chin projection is pretty good. Two year post treatment, that's how it looks. And, um, <clears throat> That's how uh, the upper and the lower arch, uh, they look after after two years. <clears throat> so now, what about Madeline? Class two, completely different uh, uh, patient here. So we have a nine-year-old, and I know it's tough when you have these nine-year-olds uh, and that you know if you do the, the right uh, analysis that it's gonna be a surgical case. And people start saying, well, she's nine year old, what can I do? And um, maybe we can do a little bit of an orthodontics and see, you know, if it works, maybe the surgery will be a little bit less. And there's no such a thing like a, a smaller surgery. So um, uh, those are the cases where, where people get in trouble because they, uh, they try to do things that they don't work. Here, don't even think about uh, distalizing, uh, using a, a, a class two corrector and the latest one that is available because it's not gonna work. Or at least it's not gonna work to get a decent result. If decent means an occlusion of facial aesthetics and function and everything. So in this particular case, what can we do at this age? Uh, definitely uh, we can do some orthodontics uh, just to correct any social problems. 
In this case, they were not, but uh, the upper jaw was really narrow. So I expand the upper jaw. Uh, you can always expand the upper jaw, do a couple of braces just to get some aesthetics and then just wait until the patient grows. Um, uh, and then uh, basically um, uh, plan for the surgery because there is nothing in this world that I know that is gonna change that pattern that you see right there. This is a, a class two high angle case with a very, very precarious size of the lower jaw and size of the ramus. This case is not growing well and it's not gonna grow well. There's no vertical control. There is nothing that you can do in this case that is gonna change the pattern. So those are the cases that uh, you will need to identify and, um, and basically do as much as we can, solve the problems, make them happy, but explain them that, uh, of course, in this case, I, I wouldn't take up per bicast. So I've done it and I regret that. And um, uh, in this case, uh, yes, I mean, I can fix the occlusion, no problems, but that will be just one, one power and I will leave the face like it is. So you can see here, I put an expander, at that age, we, we expand it. We kind of uh, collect some of the alignment in the upper jaw. But I, other than that, I wait. And then uh, look at how she grew. Uh, she's now uh, 15 years old. Um, and those are the patterns. And of course, um, it didn't get better. I wasn't expecting. This is a very bad mandible. Uh, many, of, many of these people uh, sometimes develop joint problems. Uh, not all, but some of them. So, I mean, there's so many red flags here um, that as they said yesterday, of course you need to do something because um, it's, a, it's an age where, where, uh, where they don't want, you just can't tell them just went to 15 years old and get the teeth crowded or whatever, or the over -gel. You can correct certain things, but understanding that the outcome will be most likely a sur surgical correction. So um, uh, I can fix that occlusion without problems, but that was not the point of it. So, I mean, I put the braces, I decompensate the case as much as I could using class 2D elastics and stripping the lower jaw. Uh, we put the surgical hooks and um, she had a surgery. That's just right before the surgery. And that's when she came back and I start kind of for uh, finishing the occlusion. I have to re-expand her. Um, because it wasn't enough uh, what I did at the beginning. Um, and, um, and I put a tight expander over there. There are many of these devices um, out there. And, um, and that's how she looks when we finish the case. And that's our patient, uh, I'm sorry. That's uh, after the surgery. That's how she was. And that's after the surgery. So, um, Class twos, again, not all the same, not all the same need to be treated the same way. And uh, I bring this Natalie here because this case is another example of uh, you have to do the right diagnosis. I mean, I, I, I wasn't the first sort of Danis, uh, who saw her and that's why it's, it's an interesting case. So um, 11 years old, uh, class two, lower jaw recessive, upperly flat, nasal labial angle, really obtuse. This kid, you don't want to retract those incisors, not even half a millimeter in the upper because there's no lip support there. And the problem is definitely the lower jaw. Just, just, just from, the, um, from the facial standpoint. Now, it is a full class two, um, with a, uh, an over jet. So from the occlusal standpoint, it might look like some of the other cases that I showed you before. But when you look, look at the cephalometrics, it's a very different one. Uh, it's a very short mandible. It's a mandible that is about, um, it's, it's, probably, it's about uh, eight millimeters shorter than it should be. And um, the ramus is not super big, so it's, it's just not a good grower. And, uh, and in fact, the first um, treatment that she had done uh, was a functional appliance that didn't work, her caused problems. Actually, she came to, to me because of, uh, of a joint, joint issue. Um, an 11-year-old with a clique. 
So uh, I told the mother, uh, listen, I mean, uh, she, uh, her, her, uh, uh, this is the problem. Uh, I, I don't want to try to do anything right now to correct that kind of a recessive uh, small jaw because I'm going to fail. They understood, but uh, I still could do something for her. So um, having um, uh, a good diagnosis for the transverse uh, dimension, we knew that the upper jaw was narrow compared to the lower jaw. So I actually uh, expand the upper jaw at that age. I put braces in the upper jaw to create a better round arch, uh, give her aesthetics, and she was happy. Uh, I put her on a, on a retainer at night time, a night guard. Um, and then uh, we waited until uh, she grew up and we did uh, orthodontics, uh, back uh, full orthodontics and uh, surgery. And, um, and that's uh, how, how we treat her. So, I mean, uh, this is our patient at the end of the treatment. Um, <clears throat> she's happy. Uh, that's the uh, extra oral uh, uh, view on the profile. You can see the improvement. Now, um, I would like to finish um, with uh, this case, uh, Patricia, 59 years old, because uh, of all the things that we have talked also uh, about class twos. Right now, there's a hot topic that is airways. And, um, and as long as your treatment doesn't damage um, or create uh, conflicts with the upper airways, um, I think that the camouflage is good. But in this particular case, uh, Patricia came to my office um, uh, almost 60 years old because she had already uh, diagnosed um, uh, mild to moderate uh, sleep apnea. So she kind of knew uh, what she was going on. So I explained to her that we could fix her bite, but, um, and she was told before that probably she needed a kind of a surgical intervention. So this is what we did. So um, uh, right now it's really important to pay attention to those things because um, if you go back to the nine-year-old kid that I just showed you, or the 11-year-old with recessive jaws and vertical jaws, those are patterns that eventually, in the future, eventually, the red flags for some sleep disorders. I'm not saying they will get them, but the red flags. So um, I, uh, I used to camouflage those with extractions of the upper teeth, bring back, and uh, those are not the right cases to, to do that. And, um, and, uh, and but Patricia is, is an example of, uh, of this correction. So I put her on braces. Um, now you can see here I did an STO. As you can see uh, the the uh, pre-treatment, uh, the blacks uh, tracing. It's a short mandible. Uh, yes, the A and B is nine. It's pretty severe. But again, I mean, doesn't tell me much. I mean, what it's telling me is that the uh, the lower jaw is very short. It's almost ten millimeters shorter than what it should be. Um, interestingly, so uh, I did a, an STO and based on where the teeth were, where the teeth, I predicted I could move them. Um, uh, we planned for about 5.5, 6 millimeter of advancement of the lower jaw for Patricia. And this is what we did. So I had to um, level and align again, um, then uh, level the crucial planes. I use class three elastics to uh, create a 5.5 to six millimeters of overjet. So the compensate uh, what she had. So then we have the VSSO and, um, and the mandible advance. So uh, this is just after the surgery and the rest was just do the final touches here, there. We typically spend between four and six months after the surgery before uh, we can take the braces off for good. So this is just a finishing. So we took the braces off. Um, and this is uh, one year post, post treatment uh, for Patricia. Uh, and this is the final result. You can see compared to the before, this is the after. And, uh, <clears throat> and very, uh, uh, very happy patient and, um, and improve, of course, uh, the, uh, the upper airway uh, function. So um, class two, 
in summary, I mean, it's a, it is a complicated um, topics again, um, because I don't think um, is uh, when you say class two, um, you're defining really the problem. And I think that that's why there's so many different uh, treatment modalities and everyone comes with the new gadgets here and there. But um, if you're gonna just tell me uh, that your treatment uh, definition is an overjet or an A and B, I think that uh, you're calling for trouble. So um, uh, my summary uh, that, that I would like to share with you is class two malocclusion is too un unspecific if you say just class two malocclusion. So we need a better definition or diagnosis of the problem to really understand what we have so we can solve them um, uh, with more consistency. Um, in my opinion, overjet and A and B, uh, they're not great indicators of the class two complexity. Um, I use them, uh, but I mean, I don't base my, my whole diagnosis on them. Important is to evaluate the mandible, of course, uh, the size, position, and growth and direction of the mandible. Transverse discrepancies are commonly found in class two malocclusion, specifically class two div one. So we need to pay attention to make our, a proper diagnosis of, of these um, uh, transverse pro problems. And camouflage is okay uh, for class two as long as facial aesthetics and airways are not compromised. So um, having said that, I mean, in this uh, very short 45 minute that I have, um, uh, this is what I, uh, what I, what I brought um, to you guys, and I hope um, it, can, uh, it can help, and I'm pretty sure there's some questions, and I think that we have time to, to answer them. So before we go to the questions, I want to thank you again for uh, your attention, and uh, now uh, we can go, Peter, uh, if there's any question, I'd be more than glad to answer if I can. Patricia, you should unmute. It's okay now? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Renato? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Fecci, for this great presentation with your so fantastic um, cases. Um, um, for the moment, we have um, uh, questions regarding um, um, many topics, uh, a lot of um, mechanical uh, questions and some of them are for diagnosis. Uh, the first question who came, which came was from um, uh, the, the son of our friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Bousseral. You know him very well, I'm sure. And the first question was, thank you so much, doctor, for uh, the great presentation at first. And then how was the big, the big protraction of the upper incisor? treated in the first case, how did you gain space to retract the upper anteriors? Do you have yeah. explanation for um, getting place for this first case? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I know the case you are, you are talking about. Um, it's the first one, the first yeah, one, yeah. with the proclination of the upper yeah. incisor. Mm, yeah. So, um, so again, I mean, this particular case, if you remember, was a um, a brachycephalic case with uh, with really good arches. It's just that um, uh, basically the malocclusion that, that that he has uh, tapered the arch in the front and, and flared them, and it's just ge um, it's a little bit of geometry. I mean, if if you have an arch, uh, I'm sorry about if you have an arch like this or like that. If you sort of uh, um, expand the arch, of course, the front part will kind of uh, come back a little bit. Now, we don't expand the arches uh, just dentally because that's not really stable, uh, but his transverse discrepancy was normal. I mean, so the upper arch was pretty wide with the lower arch, brachycephalic square face. It's just that the malocclusion tapered those teeth. So in that particular case, uh, it was just about uh, arch coordination and proper uh, torque of the incisors. And that's how we, 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 we actually brought those, those teeth back. Very similar 
to answer the, the, the same question, but in the lower arch, I mean, how can we, in uh, that patient that uh, uh, pretty, uh, how we uh, upright the lower incisors so much in a case where you doing uh, do extractions? And it's the same phenomenon. I mean, um, is that uh, the arch is pretty wide, but the, the teeth are compensated forward. So as soon as you upright them, uh, the teeth can, can uh, in the front can upright. Now the trick is that you can do that in every single case. This is why um, uh, this is why um, uh, you just need to analyze every case. And if you have the right the right arches, then uh, then then you can have that that that, that sort of a response. But if you have a uh, a small upper jaw uh, crowded with protrusion, I mean it's not going to happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's up to you, Peter. Do you want to ask the second question? Sure. Peter? Uh, Dr. Shashi, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. And I'm pretty sure the graduate student really appreciate, you know, the uh, different variety of class two cases that are diagnosed differently. They're that they treat with one cookbook methodology. Now, uh, you mentioned about the transverse dimension, which need to be addressed before you actually address the set or correction of class two. Now, if a patient does not have a posterior crossbite, how do you assess or diagnose the transverse dimension and decided to do expansion prior to uh, uh, treating the class two problems? Yes. So um, that's a very good question. I mean, um, I we don't really uh, see much uh, whether there's a cross buy or not because a cross buy is totally dental compensation. Let me put it in this way: you can have uh, a uh, talking about class two, you can have a huge um, uh, sagittal skeletal discrepancy with no overjet because the teeth are compensated, or you can have a class one skeletal discrepancy where um, the uh, upper incisor is really far out because of a habit. So in uh, uh, the same way in the transverse, you can have a very narrow upper jaw compared to the lower jaw and you don't see any cross bite because the teeth are compensated in the back. So um, there, are, there are many different ways that, that, that we can use to analyze that. Um, I show a couple of uh, PASF, posterior anteriors. That's the legacy of Dr. Van Arsdal that taught us how to, how to measure the transverse discrepancy uh, uh, at the jaw level uh, using a, uh, a PASF. And there are two landmarks, uh, four landmarks, two in the upper jaw, two in the lower that we use. And there is a um, analysis that actually was uh, developed long time ago by Ricketts that can be used. Now, in the recent years, um, we've been a bit more sophisticated and um, and, uh, and we've been using something very similar, but even better using uh, CBCTs, uh, combines that, I mean, it, it would be another big explanation, but the main point is you have cases where there is transverse discrepancies and you don't see them because of the piece or camouflage, and you need to have a tool to, um, to understand if there is a skeletal discrepancy between the upper and the lower during the transverse. Okay. Now, if uh, clinicians or um, PASF, uh, could they just take a set of study yeah. models, study cast, and just advance mm -hmm. the manible to a class one skeletal yeah. position and just see if there is any shortage of mm -hmm. the canine width? Absolutely. Um, we actually do that in kids sometimes, uh, so the parents can see uh, with big overjet, you can tell the, the little kid, can you just move the lower jaw forward until the overjet is kind of soft and you see that suddenly the teeth are in cross in the back. So that's another way that you can do with the models too. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you. Patricia? Yes, I have a question from Europe um, regarding uh, wits. Uh, do you think that uh, the evaluation with WITS is a good diagnostic tool? Yes, you know what, I, I use it. Um, actually, in the set that I was showing there, I have a lot of uh, numbers, and one of them is the WITS. 
um, I use it too. It's uh, way better, um, in my opinion, than the than the um, than the A and B. Um, so I, I use that a lot for class three too. I mean, when I have a width that is over five, um, I mean my minus five. I mean it's, it start becoming like a scary class class three, and I like it more. Um, because um, uh, is the, the the wheat is is working on the occlusal plane, which is basically where we as an orthodontist are working with appliances over the occlusal plane. So um, it's another tool that, that that you can use. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm just saying that I see so much A and B, A and B, A and B specifically in research and all that. And uh, and then um, uh, I think that uh, we need to have not only the AMB, but other tools. I mean, the width is one of them, absolutely. And you can always kind of uh, compare, okay, I have the widths, I have the side of the mandible, you can go back and forth and you have a better idea of the subject that you're treating, yeah. And Peter, if I can do it, um, uh, we have a question from um, re regarding the prediction of the growth, of the mandible growth. Do you have uh, any uh, protocol, or do you have uh, do you use some Bjork's signs or um, or something to evaluate the possibility of the mandibular growth before treatment? Yeah, well, um, in growing patients, um, the only thing that I that I do. Um, is um, I used to do a job analysis and I see basically how big is the mandible at that particular age. Uh, for instance, if um, uh, based on your uh, job um the, the length of the anterior cranial base should be one to one with the length of the uh, mandibular uh, length, the corpus of the mm -hmm. mandible by the age of 11. So if I have a nine year old, and, and is a few millimeters shorter the mandible, it's still pretty good, it's gonna grow. If he's um, a nine-year-old and the mandible is 10 millimeters shorter, then we're in trouble. Um, then also I see um, if, the, uh, if, the, if the growth is, is more forward, uh, kind of horizontal or vertical, so you start putting things together. I see if the if the uh, saddle angle is open or is closed. Um, of course, the tough cases are the one that they have every single thing uh, a little bit to the wrong side. Like uh, the saddle angle is too open, which means the mandible is far back position mm -hmm. is shorter, and the ramus is short. That's the worst yeah, case. The high angle case. And, um, yeah, the typical high angle, and there are not very many, but those are the ones that we, oh, um, is kind of for trouble, yeah. Yes. Especially if the class two is very large to correct, so mm -hmm. with those high angle cases. So, yes. Peter? Uh, the first case that you presented with a large overjet, you trap a coil spring uh, between the canine and the upper mm -hmm. first mold. I think that's a very clever way to derotate the mm. upper molars, which you actually can gain maybe about a couple of millimeter of uh, arch perimeter. Now, uh, the question asks is, uh, you run some short class two elastics uh, between the upper canine and the lower premolars instead of running it to the uh, molars. Now, is that has anything to do with correcting the uh, excess uh, curve of space? You know what? It Kind of helps, and um, those are one of the. I mean, uh, those are one of the things that I got, that I got used to it just for my background, and uh, uh, that I learned that long class two elastics, they were not very good um, because they can actually extrude the molars and um, they can uh, uh, sort of reposition the mandible forward like a Sunday bite. But in this in this particular brachycephalic cases, there's no problems if you run an elastic from the upper canine to the lower first molar. Um, however, I I mean I got used to do it to the first second premolar, but but then over the years we realized that actually when the patients open, and uh, there is a vertical component exactly where you want it, which is uh, to level the curve of spin. So every time that the patient opens at the level of the premolar the premolars are coming up with elastic and it definitely helped you uh, with the uh, curve speed and I and I use that uh, so this is why I, I use it 
uh, what we call the uh, short uh, class two elastics rather than long. Yeah, there is also another question about uh, using either bike plane or bike block, yes. you know, or yes. over bike cases. Now, yeah. first of all, do you use them? And if so, do you put it on the anterior teeth or you put it on the posterior teeth? Yeah, um, you know what? Uh, these are one of the things that that logic doesn't always go together with, with the clinic. And um, it definitely makes sense in deep bite cases to use an anterior bite plate to let the uh, posterior teeth to extrude and help you with the vertical. That's why I, I done it. Uh, I used uh, many times to open the by um, by by turbos, and then I realized that those things were kind of uncomfortable for the patient. So I switched to open the by from the back, which is completely uh, contradictory because you said they're gonna intrude the molars, and they do a little bit, but. Um, the 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 reverse curve speed and the flattening of the of the crucial planes uh, with the arch wires uh, overcome that and in fact um, uh, as soon as we uh, level the crucial plane in these deep by cases uh, we remove those stops in the back and you can see a millimeter of opening and then those teeth they come back together so um, right right now I don't use uh, body plates. Um, uh, to, to open the by uh, in deep by cases. Okay, Patricia. Yes, I have a question regarding the, the leveling of the curve P mm -hmm. uh, we are we were talking about. Um, yeah. um, this is the main problem when you need to level those this curve P with uh, very deep by cases, very severe deep by yeah. cases we were talking on. So, uh, do you um, do you use uh, always reverse curve? Uh, on stainless steel, or yes. do you use it on um, night eye, for example, night eye wire? Yeah, um, I, I use it always in um, uh, 19 by 25 stainless steel arch wires, and they need to be very, um, um, very rigid, um, as stiff arch wires. So not every stainless steel is the same. Uh, so. Um, Make sure that the one that you use is very stiff. Um, I don't use the night tie because with the night tie, I don't feel myself that I have a lot of um, options to customize it. Um, so if you, if for some cases it can be too much, for some cases it can be not nothing depending on the pattern. So the stainless steel, I can actually put more or less based on 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 what I see in the clinic. So uh, there are very mild cases that I put a little bit of reverse screw my, with my fingers, put it back again. Mm -hmm. There are cases that I put a lot. There are cases that actually they're very tricky. The midline in the lower is to one side and you realize that that is because the curve is being one side is deeper than on the other side. So I put reverse curve only in one side to, to, level, um, to level the midline and to level the crucial plane. So I, I think I have more versatility um, when I do it myself in uh, in the stainless steel 19 by 25. But I guess your the size of your bracket is 22 by 28. Yes, I yes I yeah. have a 22 slot. Um, uh, if I if I had a um, a 18 slot, uh, uh, I would be using probably um, 17 by 25, or depending on the bracket that you use, mm -hmm. uh, or 18 by 25 and um, I know in Italy, I have many friends that they're bi-dimensional. So, I mean, um, I think still you can do it. I mean, you just need to, uh, uh, I, I think the most important part of the wire is the stiffness because that is what held in this really brachiocephalic cases to level the crucial plane. Okay. okay. Uh, and then, you know, um, this is a quest, philosophical question from a graduate student. Now, you yeah. always have the option of either molar distalization or if you use clear aligners, sequential distalization versus extractions of premolars. How do you make those decisions whether you want to distalize teeth or you want to extract the premolar? Yeah, well, um, you know what? Um, that's a very good uh, philosophical question because um, really in the 
in the papers, I mean, I'm not saying the paper, kind of a, um, log logically it should be the same. I mean, the end result, because you want to um, somehow move this back. Now you're gonna move them back, whether you distract everything or you extract. And some people extract first premolar, some people extract second premolars, I do that a lot. Some people extract actually molars. So uh, I would say that um, definitely, um, I would say do not distalize if you have cases that there are um, more vertical cases, basically using the Jara bag. If you have a short ramus and you have a, a, um, a, a vertical uh, component, like a, a, a big uh, lower gonial angle, I wouldn't de distalize. Um, I mean, because that, that again is difficult to control the extrusion of the molars in those vertical cases and you can actually uh, uh, end up worse than if you e extract uh, in this case. So um, that would be the only thing. When you start talking more about uh, low angle cases, brachycephalic is when we start in the territory that absolutely we can, uh, we can in some cases distalize, um, let's say a little bit of an overjet, brachycephalic, there's no crowding, uh, it's just, just sagittal, then you can distalize a few millimeters, maybe two, three. I mean, I, at, at least I, I cannot distalize more than, more than that. Um, and if, if you need more, some crowding component, other things, then you can start thinking about extractions. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Yes, um, we have a question from Ute. Uh, hello, Ruther. Yeah. Hope you're well. Uh, Antonino, great presentation. But what about any specific mechanics for hyperdivergent patients? Do, don't you ever use skeletal, skeletal anchorage devices to prevent molar extrusion? Yeah, um, you, you can do that. Um, and again, I mean, there's always cases that are going to be tough. Um, uh, extremely tough. I mean, as I said, I show one that that even if you remove the molars completely just to over-rotate the mandible, it's not going to happen. It's just going to be bad. But there are some cases, and I do believe this in my opinion, I do believe that thanks God we, we, we treat um, most of our cases are basically within the, the bell curve, the 75%. And uh, they're more class two, more class three, but they're still within what we can do with orthodontics. So, and the more you get kind of outside that is when you start getting pro problems. But skeletal anchorage, um, it does work, absolutely. And um, I don't use it very much. I used to do it at some point. Um, for some re reason, um, uh, it's not, uh, it, uh, I would say very popular um, over the in the last few years in the U.S. Uh, interestingly, it became popular lately with the TAT for the for the expanders more than any other thing. But yeah, I mean, um, if you have a case where um, where you actually can do a DTO and you can see how much outer rotation you need, and that will tell you how much intrusion. That's how we used to do it. We, we used to plan for how much intrusion I needed. Uh, de definitely, uh, that um, can help you to at least control the vertical in the uh, in the bag. There's no question about it. I mean, it can help whether you use that or plate. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the uh, challenge of correcting a class two malocclusion is to control the proclination of the lower incisors. Mm. Now, unfortunately when you have a class 2 malocclusion, you already have a procline lower incisors. It's kind of like buy one, get one free. That's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now if you start out with a procline lower incisors, now obviously you can use brackets that have a negative uh, chalk or lower incisors. Yeah. Now you also show a case that you extract upper five and run class three elastics to retract the low incisors. Now, is there any other magic on it, secrets about the control of low incisors that you utilize in your practice that might be helpful to the graduate students? 
No, um, you, uh, you know, um, the, the, the one thing that, that I use beside the, the brackets and, um, and the arch wires is, of course, to analyze the space that, that you need. Where do you want those incisors? And, um, and some, in some cases, a little bit of interproximal reduction. I can tell you, this is totally clinically, in my experience, there's nothing that I can, I mean, I can put a paper on this. I mean, call a paper because I don't know, but in my experience, after several cases that I have analyzed the before and after, I know that the lower incisors, if there's no crowding, if there's no crowding, I can upright them uh, with some stripping and, uh, and power chain, I can upright them easily uh, five, six de de degrees. I've done more than that, but I would say to be very consistent, six, seven degrees, I can do that. Now, if you have um, crowding, that's a different, uh, then you have to start adding uh, that you need more space. And, and at some point, it's just impossible. I mean, you're going to end up either flirting them a little bit or you're going to end up doing some extractions. Um, the, 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 the thing is how much flaring are you willing to accept? And I think that that depends on the facial, uh, I mean, on the skeletal pattern of the patients. I know that brachycephalic patients, you can cut the incisors um, in a hundred, 140 degrees, very stable. I mean, without any problems, because I've seen that happening in, in actually non-treated patients um, and, and treated. So uh, if you start getting more uh, do, uh, do, dolicocephalic, uh, then you can go beyond numerical, uh, it's gonna be even less, 88, 87. So it's all depend on the pattern of the patient. Okay, Patricia. Yes, um, thank you, Peter. Um, I have a question from Pepe Chakes, a friend of the Angle Society of Europe. Pepe, I don't forget you. I can ask the question for now. <laughs> besides the possibility, the question is, besides the possibility of a forward position of a point for dental alveolar reasons, are there true skeletal maxillary prognatism? I had never heard, this, this is a comment from Pipe, I had never heard of a maxillary setback done in orthodontic surgery. Typical question of Pipe. I love you. Pepe. Yeah, um, <laughs> and you know what? I got to tell you this, me neither, <laughs> because um, um, I'm pretty sure, um, and I don't work in a hospital, um, uh, so I mean, if somebody is, is working in a hospital setting uh, with UC syndromes, uh, maybe yes, but in, um, in the routine cases over the last, I don't know how many years I've been uh, practicing, um, I, um, I haven't seen really any cases that I can come to my mind where, where I needed to, to to exactly do that, set back the maxilla. So I think that most uh, most of the cases is just the opposite. And um, I think that the A point is tricky. And uh, the A point, uh, the A point, but by the way, the, the A point, that doesn't really exist. I mean, we did a, a, a research when I was at Penn with the, uh, with the 3D cameras um, when they, when they start, uh, coming where, where we used to mark the eight point on the lateral view. And then mm -hmm. when you turn the, the, the face, the eight point is like, is like here. So, I mean, the eight point that we see in the x-rays uh, and we mark is actually not really uh, when you finish the eight point. So the eight point can change a lot, can change by, by the T. So it's completely then to alveolar point. And um, so I have to agree with that. I don't see very many uh, cases that I could say, Jesus, I mean, I, I would like to move the maxilla back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I hope that the PP is okay and, and fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Peter, it's to you. Okay. Now, if patients are not cooperative in wearing class two elastics, would you uh, like consider uh, using any type of fixed? functional appliance for class two correction, or would you really, really prefer using TED uh, instead, you know, just to resolve that uh, co uh, patient compliance issue? 
Yeah, um, you know what? I think that both both ways would work uh, if you have somebody uh, who's not com compliant. So um, I I think that is is based on on what people are used to it uh, in in clinical practice. I mean, I know many people, um, and we all do the same. You start using something that you like it, and then it becomes something routine for you, and it might not be a routine for the guy next next door, but you feel comfortable with. So I mean. I would say that um, I'm totally fine with using a uh, TAD or or uh, or class two corrector uh, fix, and there are many, and they're all pretty good. I think um, the only thing that I could say is is trying to choose the right patients to do the the class two correctors, um, because remember that the class two cor corrector is like a full time class two elastics on steroids, so um, they will definitely. Uh, move the molars back maybe a little bit. They will flirt the incisors. Um, they will level the the, the crucial plane. And uh, and if you do that on the wrong patient, if it's crowding, if you don't control the lower incisor, if it's a little bit vertical, uh, it might not work very well. Uh, or if the mandible is short, then you're gonna be uh, for years trying to correct that, and it's not gonna happen. That I I think that they can be used to, but um, but but depending on how you use them. I mean, that that are are anchored. So I mean, if you want to distalize with with that, maybe if you do extractions. Uh, but um, I just saw an article pu published uh, uh, recently uh, where they do a, a herb appliance with that uh and herbs without that and um and my question is i mean i mean i don't know so i mean why are you anchoring the tad uh i mean the herb with that i mean that's really improved it doesn't improve Some, sometimes uh the articles that you read statistically they find differences that they are clinically uh non-significant for, for me i mean do all the effort to gain two millimeters two millimeters they're not going to help me very much in, in the typical case where we have travel, you know what I mean? So, uh, but that's, that's just part of, uh, of the everyday uh, fight that we have. <laughs> yeah. Well, one more question is uh, we have quite a few graduate students uh, really admire the finishing of your case. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> they were wondering, how do you settle the posterior occlusion and what is your yes. retention protocol for class two cases? And you yeah, have well, a I mean, Do you have a special secret? No, for well, finishing um, for finishing. Yeah, the the secret really is uh, bracket placement. Um, I learned, and and Renato can, and and Peter, you guys know very well, Doctor Larry Andrews. I mean, uh, I, I learned mm -hmm. from Six from case. him to. Uh, to put the uh, the bracket on the FA point by eyes and get get the practice to do it and um and at the beginning you have to reposition more when you get more practice you just can put the bracket in the right spot um, uh, very often and then when you do that and you level the occlusal plane basically things start getting better and um and the six key almost every key has an application to the mechanics that is. It's not the right time right now to talk about it, but key number one to key number six, we can find an application in the mechanics, in the wire sequence, and the type of wires that, that we use, we can justify that based on the six keys of occlusion. So this is really important. Renato, may I ask the very yeah. last question, please? How, how can I say no? Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just your finishing wire. What is your finishing wire? I have a question regarding this one. You have special uh, finishing wire. I saw yeah, that. Yeah. Well, a um, branded wire. Yeah, it's a multi-braided wire, and um, and that's a wire that has been used for finishing uh, for many people uh, for years. And um, and the reasoning is the following: it's a rectangular wire, um, stainless steel that can eventually sort of uh, fill the slot or almost fill the slot. So um, you can run vertical elastics without having the typical problem that um, you will roll the, the teeth in, like Larry Andrew says. Like, uh, I mean, you use vertical elastic from the buckle and the, and the teeth occlude, but they open from the lingual 
because you're using round wires or no wires. Some people just put elastic without, mm -hmm. without wires. So um, uh, final wire has to be rectangular, has to have some flexibility. That's why it's, it's braided. Uh, so um, the, the, the teeth can accommodate with the rubber bands. And I use that only for four weeks uh, because if you overdo it, then you start paying a price for it too. And do you ask to your patient to chew chewing gums with this wire? Uh, no, um, I mean, that, that's the old tweet things that uh, they used to put the holly retainers and chew a lot of uh, gums. I don't tell them, but I don't think it will hurt uh, mm -hmm. if they do that. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, you use, you chew and, and the teeth, are, I mean, accommodate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I finished. I'm sorry, Renato. <laughs> Afraid, very sorry, no, I'm perfectly fine, Patricia, but you are the queen. Uh, <laughs> I think it's you. time to, to stop the webinar. I'm sure that we could continue with questions forever. Uh, so thank you very much, Antonino. But it's thank time you. now for Eve to close the webinar of today. Eve, please. Right. Right. Thanks, Renato. Yeah, Antonino, well, uh, thank you on behalf of everybody to have shared this outstanding material and those extremely well-documented uh, cases on the test two treatments, which are the bread and butter of, of, of our orthodontic practices. I would like to thank also our moderators of today, uh, Dr. Patricia Obak de Jean from the Angle Society of Europe and uh, Professor Peter Nang from Angle East. Remember that this week, after Professor O'Brien and uh, Dr. Sander's excellent lecture yesterday, and after today's superb presentation from Antonino, we are keeping uh, going on with our class two treatments. Tomorrow, we'll have two speakers, uh, Dr. Mauro Cozzani from La Spezia, Italy, former Boston University graduate. He is the only orthodontist to be members of the Angle Society on both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> if I recall, he's a member of Angle East and the Angle Society of Europe. And Dr. Antonio Manni from Raccale, Italy. Well, uh, both will talk about herbs treatments, uh, not about the herbs appliance introduced initially by Emil Herbst, uh, the Fifth International Dental Congress in 1909 in Berlin. Neither the one later modified and improved in the late 70s by Hans Punches in Gießen. And uh, I'm inviting you to attend tomorrow's lectures to discover the specific type of herbs supply that they are using. We'll finish up the week on Thursday with a second generation of phenotics as I am, Dr. Mohammed Massoud, originally from Saudi Arabia. Assistant Professor of Orthodontics at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine in Boston, Program Director of the Advanced Graduate Education Program in Orthodontics, and Diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics. He will lecture on the management of skeletal 